Funding for the Hinckley Report is made possible in part by the Cleone Peterson Eccles Endowment Fund. Tonight on the Hinckley Report, who is in and who is out? Politicians declare their candidacies, setting the stage for Utah's 2024 election. Lawmakers gear up for the legislative session as they announce their major priorities. And our panel reacts to national headlines. Good evening and welcome to the Hinckley Report. I'm Jason Perry, director of the Hinckley Institute of Politics. Covering the week, we have Kate Bradshaw, member of the Bountiful City Council, Brian Schott, political correspondent with the Salt Lake Tribune, and Marty Carpenter, partner at Northbound Strategy. So glad you are all here this evening because uh, a lot is happening in politics, but this is where we start seeing who is going to be up for election for this next cycle. And we're watching, there's some surprises, there are some, some names we know pretty well, but let's jump, jump right in because Kate, on Monday, this coming Monday is the filing deadline. So names are starting to pour in even right now. So let's talk about the Senate race, for example. Uh, uh, Senator Mitt Romney, he's decided not to run. This race has become quite crowded. It has. There are a lot of Republicans that have filed, and this week we had surprises. Utah moved up their yeah. filing yeah. to the first week of January, so we're seeing all this action, you know, right at the start of the new year. We've got, um, of course, those that we've known would be in the race from the beginning. Yeah. Um, former Speaker Brad Wilson, for instance, um, Mayor Trent Staggs, for instance. Uh, but Congressman John Curtis, you know, the will he, won't he, will he, won't he, he is. Yeah. He's running. And so now you have, quite frankly, what is looking like a really crowded Republican field for that uh, open U.S. Senate seat for mm -hmm. Utah. Brian, you're one of the people who are really breaking the news about this Congressman Curtis jumping into this race. Talk about what that does in terms of the race overall and for Utahns, particularly in that district that have got to know him pretty well over the years. Well, he does have the most name ID of any of the candidates in the race right now. Um, there was an independent poll done by a super PAC that was sub supporting him that came out uh, last month in December, and it showed that he had a big lead over Wilson, over Staggs in a three-way race uh, among re re Republican voters, and a big lead over Wilson if it was a head-to-head. -head. So he is the front runner right now. Name ID is going to play a big part of this because it is a crowded field, but that's not unusual for the state. Remember in 2018, when Orrin Hatch stepped down, there were a dozen re Republicans in that race. Uh, last year, with, with, with Chris Stewart, 11 re Republicans got in. And in 2017, after J Jason Chaffetz stepped down, once again, 11 Republicans, and that race was won by John Curtis. I look at that poll and say that's a bit of a ground softening poll to enter the race, like it's a super PAC that's supporting him. So numbers are numbers, but numbers are also designed to get you where you want to go. There's a difference between a crowded field and a viably crowded field. There are going to be a lot of people in that race. There are two viable candidates in that race right now. It's Brad Wilson, the former speaker, and it's John Curtis. Curtis may have some additional name ID. That's helpful, I guess, initially in raising money, but that's not going to be a problem for Brad Wilson, who's been out shaking people down, I guess, is not the nicest way to say it, but out raising money uh, already. So I, I still look at that's going to be a two-person race. I don't think that name ID advantage for Curtis is something that he's necessarily going to hold on to the entire way. But, but how does it impact sort of the, the voting field for the people on the, the various parts of the spectrum? We have seven Republicans so far, as of today, that have filed for that race. But Kate, they're, we're, they're battling for certain segments of the Republican Party. And it, it sounds like we have several that are to the more conservative end. I don't know who's on the more moderate side. How does this play out and how do they campaign? Because it seems like a lot are trying to do the, the I'm the more conservative candidate message right now. You know, we still have the dual path to the primary ballot. Um, so you'll have some candidates that are going to be playing to a caucus convention crowd, right? And that tends to be a little bit more of a conservative crowd. And you have those that are going to pick the dual path, and those that are most serious will likely pick the dual path. And, the, you know, those that may opt into maybe even just a signature gathering path. Uh, traditionally, a, a serious candidate is going to do both paths, but you are looking at various slices of lanes and trying to, to pick where those issues are going to be. Um, there's a lot that probably overlaps between Brad Wilson and John Curtis in terms of their brand of mm -hmm. Republicanness. And so they're going to be looking for ways to try and, you know, take more space um, and gain more Republican voters. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Brian. Well, you know, 
sure Brad Brad Wilson has been the speaker, but he's been elected in a safe Republican district. And I went back and looked at the number of votes he had to get to get office. Last year it was 12,000. The year before it was 19,000, or the cycle before that it was it was, was 19,000. The number of votes is that 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 the Spencer Cox got in the 2020 GOP pr primary was 190,000. So it's a lot big. It's a lot di different running in a safe Republican Repub seat where you have to get a small num number of votes than and go trying to go to a statewide race. Curtis, yes, is coming from from a, a congressional di district, but he's a higher pro profile candidate. He will be able to tap into his Washington D.C. Uh, uh, a fundraising. Uh, 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 I guess um, uh, groups and, and and be able to fund his campaign. So you know, uh, it, it's like I've said, the the Utah political landscape is littered with the bodies of former sp speakers of the House who thought that they could parlay that into a higher office. Yeah, so Marty, how are they differentiating themselves? And if what you're saying is, there, you would say there are two. You would, you said two viable. I mean, the front runners, I guess you would say, right yeah. there. I mean, but but this, plura this plurality issue could still happen. Are these are these other ends of the spectrum not going to have that much of an impact on voters generally, or do you really think it's just going to consolidate almost immediately? I mean, it's really still fascinating to me how much candidates are inclined to go far right for that convention side of the process when it really in practicality does not matter and has proven to not matter in most cases ever since the second path to the ballot came into play. I think the much smarter and safer play is to say, here's my record or here's what I'm running on and prepare, position that so that you are ready for a primary. Go get the signatures, position yourself for the race that actually matters. That would be my advice to anybody in that race. Uh -huh. uh, before I leave this and go into some other races, because it's come up a couple of times, the signature gathering process, I mean, do, do any of you have an opinion about whether or not that is just the way it is now? Are there negative ramifications from the party faithful if you get signatures now? There are ramifications from the party faithful if you get signatures, but any serious candidate needs to get signatures and will get signatures. Um, you know, Marty has correctly identified that, you know, the caucus convention path hasn't mm -hmm. been uh, as impactful. If you want to get to the primary, if you're a serious candidate, that's your path and that's what you need to focus on. And I think it's it's political malpractice not to go get signatures mm -hmm. if you're really serious about this race. Mm -hmm. There, there's pushback from the party faithful, but there's not enough of the party faithful once you get into the race that counts in the primary. They're vastly outnumbered by regular Republican voters who just have not aligned yeah. with what the caucus convention group uh, cares about. We'll, see, we'll probably see more names in this particular race. The Democrats have put forward a candidate, Archie Williams III, and independent American candidate Robert Newcomb also has filed. We'll watch this race very closely to see where that one goes. Uh, let's go through our congressional districts because, of course, they're all up. and uh, the first congressional district. Uh, Marty, uh, Blake Moore, Congress Blake Moore has a uh, couple challengers. Has a couple challengers. Inter -party, inter -party challengers. He has a couple challengers. That's probably in the sense of like just enough to make it so you have to do more than roll the ball out there and say you played the game. Um, you know, he's he's going to be in a pretty safe spot. I'm not at all worried about where Blake Moore is right yeah. now. Say, yeah. Brian, say. Yeah, I, I agree. Moore is in is is an up and comer in Congress. He's in lead leadership um, in 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 the Republican caucus. He he should be reelected re pretty pretty easily. So far, no Democrats filed for that particular race. Any of the names you're seeing come forward in that? I'm not seeing a lot in that first congressional district, and I think it is because of Congressman Moore's new leadership mm -hmm. position, and that does unlock a really interesting new fundraising realm yeah. for him um, that he can tap into, which will make him obviously a very strong candidate and someone that would be difficult to beat. Mm -hmm. uh, the second congressional district, uh, Congresswoman Celeste Malloy, so far doesn't have anyone filed, but I understand we may have someone, uh, an interparty challenge there. Brian? Yeah, um, he, uh, the name is escaping uh, me. Colby right. Jenkins. It's, it's Col Colby J Jenkins. He's a former Green, Green Beret and a business consultant. He's also from St. George. Um, and uh, uh, Con Congresswoman Malloy has decided she's only going to go through the caucus and convention system. She will not be getting sig signatures, which is what she did the last time. Um, so she's staking her claim on that. If Jenkins can get some money and spend the money to get on the ballot with sig signatures, uh, that could be a, a real race because she doesn't have much. much much of a rec record to run on. She's only been in office for, for about a month or so. Yeah, go ahead, Marty. Incumbency is usually an advantage. A three-month incumbency is a little bit more limited, certainly more limited in how much of an advantage it is. She has essentially been campaigning now for a few months, yeah. and even though she's won and got to go to D.C., that's still sort of an ongoing campaign to show the voters, this is who I am and my argument for re-election. Mm -hmm. What's interesting about this one, too, uh, Kate, is that uh, if Colby jumps in this race, which we understand he may, it's a, sort of another rural candidate, which was a big part of her 
or her approach was rural Utah getting representation uh, in Congress. It is interesting. I'm a resident of that district, um, and I live in Davis County. Mm -hmm. And so to see the district now become very divided between the south end and the north end is, is, is really interesting. Um, I hope that my north end doesn't seem like it's forgotten by the candidates. So hopefully they'll be spending an equal amount of time um, learning about the issues of, of the, the northern Wasatch part of that district. Uh, you know, Celeste has not stopped campaigning because she knew yeah. that she'd have to head right in. So she's lucky in the sense that she can just keep that um, machine going and has staff and people in place. Um, you know, she did a fantastic job uh, securing endorsements from uh, local officials from running that um, quite frankly, a smaller dollar amount campaign against significant names. And so I'm a fan, and I think that she's going to continue to, to wow us and surprise us with her ability to um, run a very smart, targeted, strategic campaign. But so far, the thing that wows me is that political malpractice. Go get the signatures. If there's an advantage you have by having already won, it's that little bit of an advantage in name ID. Go out and use that to your advantage by making sure you get on the primary ballot. And I wonder if there's going to be a hangover from the way that she won the nomination uh, at, at, at the hastily called con convention after Congressman Stewart stepped down. She was not re registered to vote in the district and did not fix that until after the filing de deadline had closed. She had moved to Vir Vir Virginia. There were a lot of things about her ba background that we didn't know about until after she had secured the, the nomination. And I wonder if the delegates are going to be so for forgiving, because that might leave a bad taste in their mouth. She also did not vote in the 2022 and the 2020 election. And, uh, and, and so you wonder if that's going to impact her, uh, I guess, pop popularity with, with the de delegates who she's relying on to uh, to put her back in Washington. If you've won before, go to the larger field of voters. Instead of keeping it to a smaller group, you just have better odds. Mm -hmm. uh, th all of these uh, changes have brought about a really interesting race in the third congressional district, Kate. Uh, and a lot of names that we've been seeing for a little while are eyeing this particular potential race, but with Congressman Curtis saying he's not going to run, this is like a rare open spot for one of these races. And we have a couple people that we've seen recently, like Utah State Senator Mike Kennedy, uh, former Utah GOP Chair Stuart Pay, Mayor Rod Byrd, just name a couple of these, uh, these candidates. This is a pretty interesting wide open race right now. It is, and it is rare. When you get one of those open seats, you've got these people who've been thinking about it and planning, and all of a sudden they jump and shift. And of course, John Curtis making his big announcement yeah. this week really shifted who was maybe looking at the uh, the third district seat. Um, one name I'm not seeing that I've been looking for and hitting refresh on the on the filing so that it w I would know when it came up is uh, State Auditor John Dougal. Yeah. He has announced that he's not going to run to continue to be our uh, state auditor, and I have been expecting him to maybe show up um, filed for that seat, and I think that would be uh, an interesting move, and it would definitely shake up that list of candidates. Yeah. What are you all hearing about this one? Um, you know, he's been r rumored to be looking at the Senate race, at, at the, at the, goob goob, at the gov governor's race, mm -hmm. and, and CCD3. I think he'll show up in CCD3, but who knows? This one feels like the most wide open of all of the mm -hmm. congressional races, whether it's the House or the Senate, right? Even though there's a crowded field that we talked about on the on the Senate side, this just feels like the most wide open where there's no one stepping in to say, oh, that guy's the front runner for mm -hmm. sure. You could make the argument for Kennedy because he ran against Romney, so he's got some name ID there and some conservative bona fides, but he could, you could also make the argument that if Dougal gets in, no, no one has sort of like above the state legislative level of, of popularity or of, of, of proven mm -hmm. ability to win, even mm -hmm. though the, the auditor is a statewide office, but you know, it's a little bit different than running for the Senate. Uh, we do have a Democrat in that race. Glenn Wright has filed uh, already for that, op that open seat. We'll watch this one closely. And just for a second to finish this off, the fourth congressional district. Uh, so Brian Burgess Owens, so far, no other Republicans challenging him. Yeah, and 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 I don't think that he'll get a, a serious ch challenger, at least from the uh, G G GOP. He's he's going to cruise the nomination. He's, 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 he would be hard to beat. Two that, Democrats. That one actually oh, yeah. surprised me a little bit, I, that there's no one would just sort of jump in and throw their hat in the ring. I think that there are some folks who are running for, you know, the Senate who might have said, mm -hmm. well, maybe I got a better option. Not that there's anything, you know, that I see terrible weakness mm -hmm. um, in Congressman yeah. Owens, but just that nobody would say, I don't know, like I, that's, mm -hmm. a, that's usually a fairly open seat or a seat that's in play. Maybe I could throw my hat in the ring there. It just maybe. surprises me that the more people haven't considered that. Maybe we have fourth district fatigue. I mean, we've had such battles in the fourth yeah, district, yeah. right? Year over year, you know, every every cycle, just a lot of battles there. And maybe maybe we finally hit the point where we've like fatigued out the fourth district. Yeah. <laughs>
Well, we do have two Democrats filed in that race, Jonathan Lopez and Katrina Fallick Wang. So watch uh, to see if anyone changes and decides to jump into that one. Uh, the governor's race, can we talk about that? Wow, this is shaming out to be an interesting group of candidates. So Ryan, you've been talking about this one and you had a great story even today on this one right here. So Spencer Cox has filed, Phil Lyman, former uh, Utah uh, GOP and G GOP chair Carson Jorgensen. Those are the three primary challenges right now. And this one is, I think is gonna be Fast, fascinating to watch because Lyman and Jorgensen are clearly staking out positions to Cox's p political right. I don't know how much room there is over there, but they're going to be fighting over the same group. An interesting t tidbit, though, uh, and back to Mar Mar Marty's point about gathering six signatures, Phil Lyman, staunch defender of the caucus, person who's tried to get rid of mail-in voting and, 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 uh, and, and talked about election integrity, he has filed to gather sig signatures, which has surprised a lot of people people. They're, they're really shocked that he would do do that, but I think he realizes that he's going to need that, that safe safety net to ensure that he gets to the, the, the primary. The question then becomes, for a candidate like Phil Lyman, who definitely is more in line with the caucus, can he get the number of signatures that he needs? Mm -hmm. That's what's going to be interesting to me. Um, I, I look at the governor's race as shouldn't be surprising to anybody. We have an incumbent who's very popular. He's going to get on to the primary ballot, and he's going to be perfectly fine. This may be kind of interesting for politicos to watch. At the end of the day, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. Spencer Cox is going to get reelected. Yeah, it's, it's interesting that there are challengers to Governor Cox, the, the, with the names that we've known so well, but certainly they're trying to carve out some space on the more conservative end of the political spectrum. It's interesting to me because uh, Phil Lyman and um, Carson Jorgensen have very similar you know, yeah. belief structures, and they fall in really the, the same spot on the Republican Party spectrum of being to the right. And so how they intend to differentiate e mm. each other, for, you know, they'll, they'll be fighting for the same core group of, of you know, staunch Republican caucus supporters. And so I see them just dividing what is a small group among themselves and, again, leaving the path very clear yeah. for the governor to wouldn't, be reelected. Wouldn't shock me at all that if at the convention, presuming Governor Cox goes to the convention, that you see uh, Lyman Jorgensen one, two in some order, Spencer Cox in third, mm -hmm. and then six weeks later when we get to the primary, he's going to win it by 35 plus points. Well, but if you go back to 2020, Cox only got 36 percent of the vote in a four-way pr primary. I've spoken to people close to, to Jor Jorgensen, and they they believe that if they can get into a one-on-one -on -one in the primary against Cox, and Jorgensen is only going through the con convention path, they their, their theory is if they can get into a one-on-one, -on -one, they might have a shot against him because of the way Cox won the GOP no nomination four year, years ago. It was only about a third of the party who voted for him. It was only about a third of, 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 the, of the GOP. And and as, as, as Jorgensen told me in my story today, you know, we really haven't settled whether he is the choice of, of, of the G of GOP because, you know, he didn't get over 40 per, per percent. So I wonder if that's going to be a factor. So that would be, in my mind, uh, making an assumption that all of the Huntsman voters are going to go right instead of to the Cox side that's more sort of in the mainstream of the party. I would not make that assumption. I don't think they all will go Cox, sure. but I think the majority of them end up lining, aligning with the current governor. Uh, the next race, the attorney general's office. So Kay, uh, uh, our attorney general, Sean Reyes, announced that he's not going to be running again. Immediately we saw a former GOP chair, Derek Brown, with, with Governor Herbert behind him announcing. But a couple other names uh, this past week, uh, Frank Mylar and former assistant AG Rachel Terry have filed this week. Yes, I think this is an interesting race. Obviously, now that is also an open seat. Um, you know, Derek came out strong early with a with a big list of supporters. Um, I'm particularly interested, though, to see Rachel Terry file. I've known her for a number of years. She worked for the Utah League of Cities and Towns. She's currently the state's risk manager. Um, she's in, you know, a very active practicing uh, attorney. Uh, Derek has, you know, an interesting political background, um, you know, in being a party chair, um, working uh, back in D.C. for Congress and, um, you know, working in, in government affairs and, and lobbying. Um, he is an attorney, obviously, an important criteria for the job. Um, but it'll be interesting to see whether voters are, um, you know, focused on somebody who's who's maybe more, um, uh, you know, a manager of, of the office or somebody maybe who's been more actively involved in the practice of, of law um, going forward.
Is that what you're hearing, Brian? Um, yeah, I, I, I think that, that Derek Brown has one big advantage. He worked for Mike Lee. Mike Lee is a supporter of his, and that is just magic at these G G GOP co conventions. The delegates love Mike Lee. So Mike Lee endorses you. You've got a really good shot. So uh, I, I, that, that, I think, is one thing working in his favor. Um, I, I, I really think that this, this race, or the best way that these candidates could position themselves is to just clean up the office. I mean, there's been so much scandal for over the last three attorneys gen gen general that we've had that, um, you know, if, if you come in and say, I'm going to clean this up, I'm going to get it back to doing the job it was supposed to do, rather than writing mo movie scripts or hanging out with, with Tim Ballard or, or, or what, whatever, I think that that is the kind of thing that voters are really going to be lo looking for. Derek Brown seems to have somehow become like the, the model politician because he's done all the things that the caucus convention side and the party like. He's been the party chair. He's worked for Mike Lee. He's served in the legislature. But he's also done that in a way where he hasn't had to charge far to the right mm -hmm. on any issues. And for an attorney general, I think you're right. What we're looking for, most voters, I think, would say what we're looking for is someone who can just do the job in a low drama kind of <laughs> way. Yeah, reclaim the law office aspect of the attorney general's office. I think people are talking about that. Can I get to a couple lo very local races? Uh, Kay, you work so much with our state legislature. A lot of movement right now, uh, including a few people who decided they're not going to run, which is opening some spots. Uh, uh, Senator uh, Dave Buxton not going to run. Dan Thatcher not going to uh, run for that race, uh, for his Senate race again. Can I talk about some of the movement you're seeing and how this is going to impact the legislation um, and maybe the priorities of the coming year? You know, we mentioned kind of at the start of the show, the filing deadline has moved up to before the start of the legislative yeah. session. We haven't had that. And so it really changes whether um, you know that somebody is going to have a challenger, whether an incumbent yeah. is going to be retiring, and how that factors into how they vote. Are they, you know, uh, you know worried about an, an inter-party challenge at the caucus? And so that will be a new factor we haven't yeah. had. It'll be interesting to see that play out. Um, you know, we are seeing some some retirements. There's always some natural turnover, particularly in the state house. You know, where they're they're up every two years. Um, you know, Greg Buxton had served in the House, served in the Senate, um, and and has decided it's it's time and he's going to retire. Uh, no surprise there with with Cal Musselman, who's who's in the mm -hmm. you know the uh, overlapping House seat, who's long signaled that that he would be interested. Um, in, in moving over to uh, the House side. But, you know, you have some of these others in, um, you know, Brian King, who's decided to move to governor, Mark Wheatley, longtime Democrats who, who have decided they would make a move. Um, Senator Thatcher, who's interestingly leaving the Senate to potentially to serve on the county Actually, council. He, he would not have to leave his seat if he, he loses because right. he's yeah. not up this he's year. He won re-election awesome in 2020. Midterm yeah. spot. But, but it's, it's a free interesting. Run for him. It's an interesting move, though, to go from the Senate to the county, I think, is, mm -hmm. is um, you know, where you want to have an influence on state policy, and he's very much signaled in his announcement, I want to have an influence on, on what he feels is happening at the county. I also think that 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 that, that, that Thatcher's move, which is fa fascinating, is motivated by what happened in redistricting. He lives in West Valley. He's lived there his entire life, and his neighborhood is now barely in his Senate di district. His district covers uh, Salt Lake, Utah, and, and, and Tutuila counties, and he really w likes working on the, the local issues for that area. That's, that's what he told me. And so I think that that's one of the reasons why he's this this uh, uh, county council race is so uh, attractive to him. The one that surprised me was Robert Spendlove leaving well, yeah, after he's really made me. his way onto the executive appropriations. And I would mm -hmm. say he was, you know, right. He's one of the most influential members of the legislature when it comes to the dollars and cents and putting the money in everybody's pocket where it needs to go in each uh, in each uh, part of the executive branch. Mm -hmm. That one just surprised me. I actually think it's a big loss for the legislature. Someone with his um, not only institutional knowledge having worked in the Herbert administration, but as an economist and someone who really knows the budget, that to me was one of the more surprising ones to see that he won't be running again. And it also caught a bunch of his co colleagues yeah, by, by, by surprise. They were not ready for that. And if you look, there's not a lot of candidates who have fi filed yet to, 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 to take his place. That's, that's right. And, and you mentioned Brian King, who is not running because he is running for, for governor uh, for the, the state as well. Just really quickly in our last couple of minutes, uh, how is this impacting, first, the filing deadline? Because that was such a good point. It used to be you could get through the session. Uh, uh, and, you know, tackle some of those issues. But now now they're filing beforehand, Kate. So is that going to flavor uh, how they approach some of these more difficult issues during this session, knowing, uh, knowing what we know now and maybe give a preview of what we are going to see? Yeah, they may, you know, they used to be able to hold those things really close to yeah. the vest and, and, and now potentially they are not. Um, you know, interestingly, the, both the House and the Senate last year, they moved some really 
tough legislation, controversial legislation, in the early weeks of the session, first two weeks, moved it, moved it through and moved it fast. Um, it was an interesting tactic. Uh, and, you know, one question we've all been wondering from the, the, those watching from the cheap seats is, will those same kind of maneuvers yeah. happen again this year where they're looking to move some things through quickly in the early days of the session. And they've definitely forecasted some interesting issues that haven't been as big on their priority list, but are this year, energy policy significantly being one of them. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, Brian, we're going to see a couple big ones, right? We, we, we're probably going to see some some uh, bills dealing with uh, EDI, equity, diversity, and inclusion, others, uh, including I think lotteries. We're going to see a lot of cu culture war bills because this is an election year. And I think that because Gov Governor Cox does have two pr primary challengers, that's going to put him in a really hard spot because he is liked among a number of de Democrats as well. But if he signs some of these really co controversial, bills, um, you know, uh, I'm, I, I know that there are probably going to be some anti-trans leg legislation come up there. You'll see the DEI stuff, um, uh, uh, and you'll see about free speech on college campuses, things along those lines that really are hot but button issues that play well to the Republican base. It could put him in a really tough spot deciding what to do, and, and I think that because of that, you're going to see legislative leadership uh, push him on some of these issues because they know that he's going to be in a really tough spot. That's going to have to be our last comment there. But we're going to watch this session very closely. Thank you so much for your comments tonight. And thank you for watching The Hinkley Report. This show is also available as a podcast on pbsutah.org slash Hinkley Report or wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you for being with us. We'll see you next week.